All right, I think we're gonna get started here. Hello, everybody. My name is Matt Danner. I'm the Associate Manager for Global Brand Marketing, and I'd like to welcome you all here to Deck Building 101. Joining us today, we have Dave Marcy. Dave Marcy is our Senior User Experience Designer for Magic Duels. So hopefully all of you have had a chance to download Magic Duels to your iOS device or to your PC via Steam or to, with Xbox Live, and Dave works on that team. Also joining us, we have Sam Stoddard. Sam Stoddard works as a senior game designer. He helps us making the cardboard cards, uh, both in card design as well as card balance. Also with us, Pro Tour Hall of Famer, Mike Turian. Mike Turian actually works for Wizards now. He's a digital project manager working on Magic Online. And so we're here to talk about deck building 101 because deck building can kind of feel overwhelming, right? Uh, there are approximately 16,000 unique cards in Magic the Gathering right now. And that can kind of feel overwhelming. So Dave's going to go ahead and, and walk us through how to get started on that. Thanks, Matt. Uh, OK, so first question. Uh, who here has not built a Magic deck, deck before? All right, we've got enough people. This is great. All right, we're going to start from the beginning. This is excellent. So I know exactly how you feel. About six years ago, I started playing Magic myself, and I was completely overwhelmed by this 16,000 different cards that I could put in my deck. I had no idea where to begin. One of the challenges uh, is not only are there all these different cards to choose from, but there's these things called formats that tell you which cards or which sets you're allowed to choose from among, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In addition, there's different kinds of deck strategies. You can choose to have a very aggressive deck or one that's very controlling, keeping your opponent from doing what they want to do. So we'll talk about that for a minute. There's also a question on different kinds of uh, ways of building your deck. There's constructed and limited. Constructed means you build a deck out of cards that are already in your collection, or limited, you come to the event and are given some cards and you try to do the best you can on the spot. The, the major issue is that we have a blank piece of paper problem, especially in Constructed. Where do I even begin? So to get started, I want to talk about the five colors of magic. Now, you've seen these before. Each one of these colors has something that it does very well and other things that it doesn't do very well. And so what many players will do is they will choose two colors to try to take advantage of the strengths and weaknesses of some of the different colors of magic. And the way we do that is by picking two of the colors and, and trying to build a deck around them. For example, uh, one of my favorite colors, green, is really excellent at building resources to overwhelm your opponent with big, humongous creatures with really big power and toughness. However, it doesn't do a very good job of dealing with opponent's threats. So a good color to pair it with would be black. And if you take green cards and black cards, black is very good at removing your opponent's creatures. And you make a deck using both of them, you can take advantage of the benefits of one color and the benefits of the other. Now, to get started, uh, if you've never built a deck before, you can do what I did, which is play with a deck that's already been built or pre-constructed. Now, if you've gotten your PAX swag bag or spoken to the Lady Planeswalker Society on the first floor, you may have been given some of these sample decks here at the top. The sample decks are 30-card uh, decks that are used to kind of get started with magic, and they're just a single color. And you can take any two of the sample decks, shuffle them together, and begin playing a game of magic very easily. If, uh, if you've been playing with those for a while and you want to get a little bit more in-depth, you can try an intro pack, which are sold here and also at just any local store. These intro packs will take two colors and, and has a very strong strategy that you can play with in them. One of the nice things about pre-constructed decks is that you can play with them for as long as you'd like. Uh, I actually played with pre-constructed decks for, for, for a whole year before I started making my first deck. And one of the things I liked about it is it showed me what a good deck looked like. Here are some of the things that a good deck looks like. First, you want to have, in Constructed, at least 60 cards. And in that, you want to have roughly 40% of those cards to be lands. Now, these basic lands are your resources to be able to cast your spells. Uh, lands, uh, the way I describe it to some of the people who learn the game is it's kind of like magic's money. And you need some money in order to pay for casting spells. And maybe you need some green money and some black money to pay for green spells and black spells. Uh, so 40% of your deck needs to be lands, so all shuffled in real good into your deck. Then the rest of your deck needs to be creatures and other spells, 
and you can break that into roughly 40% and 20% of your deck. Now, these are not rules right here, the percentage of, of lands and other spells. These are just rules of thumb. Uh, in fact, one player that I played against in Magic R&D played with a deck that had zero creatures in it and totally destroyed me. But that was a, a, a rare example. For the most part, you want to start with about 40% of your cards being creatures. Now, the next thing you want to worry about is things that are, that are mana costs. Those are in the top right corner of a card. You see the little funny symbols and numbers. That's how much mana it takes in order to cast a spell. Now, this graph right here shows that you want to have a lot of cards that cost somewhere between two and three mana and then decrease after that. What this does is it allows you to be able to cast a lot of spells early in the game that can help you move uh, your deck forward. Uh, for example, if you're playing an aggressive deck, your, your spells that cost two and three mana may be creatures that are two twos and three threes, maybe with some extra benefit like first strike or flying. If you're playing a controlling deck, maybe these spells are big walls that have a little bit, amount of, a little bit of power but a lot of toughness to keep your opponent from attacking you very well while you're building up uh, mana for bigger spells later. And then you need to keep your colors roughly down to two. Now, if you have in more than two colors that you want to play, we'll talk later about how to fix your colors so you can have more colors in your deck. And finally, you want to have a plan. And as I was talking about earlier, you want to have either a very aggressive deck, or maybe a controlling deck, or one that just has got some really great, powerful cards that you can play in the middle of the game. This plan is very important. You want to make sure that all of the cards you choose follow that plan. You want to have a lot of cards that do the same thing. Now, uh, my kids who play a lot of magic with me, they love cards that do all sorts of crazy stuff. So sometimes they'll have cards that are flying creatures, and sometimes they'll have uh, removal spells, and these are all good. But then occasionally they'll put in a card that, say, makes uh, the opponent run out of cards in their deck. Uh, we call that milling. And if you put mill cards in a deck that's not all about milling, then your plan gets kind of um, uh, mixed up where some of your cards are accomplishing one plan and others are doing a different plan. So try to pick one plan and make, all, make sure all of your cards follow it. And I'll show you an example a little bit later on. The thing that matters is that if you're not ready to start building a deck of your own, stay with these pre-constructed decks for as long as you feel comfortable. It is no problem at all to keep playing with pre-constructed decks. And if anyone rolls their eyes at you, tell them, I'm having fun, that's all that matters. I'm here to have fun to play Magic. So as far as ma mana fixing is concerned, if you wanted to have more than two colors in your deck, one way to do that is with lands that can be tapped for more than one color. Now most uh, of the basic lands you've seen, for example, the mountains and the forests here, just tap for red or green mana. But you can also have uh, dual lands that can tap for one or another a color of mana. These cards on the right, Saltwater Cliffs and Thornwood Falls, uh, were released in the set uh, Fate Reforged. And these cards, they enter the battlefield tapped, so you can't use them the turn they come into play, but you gain a life when you play them, so it can help prolong the game a little bit. And then, later on, you can tap them for the extra color that you need, in this case, blue. So all of my lands can tap for either red or green, and then some of them can help me with that blue. Uh, some, of our, some of our fans call this splashing for a third color. Now, after you've played with these pre-constructed decks for a while and you're ready to try something of your own, uh, one thing that we make is something called the Deck Builder's Toolkit. Has anyone seen that before or, or, or bought one? Now, the Deck Builder's Toolkit, which I love, is it's kind of the beginning of a collection. In this, you get 285 cards. A lot of them can really help you drive and focus a deck around a specific theme. For example, in Magic Origins, one of my favorite themes is a white-black theme. If you play with cards that are white and black, many of them uh, deal with enchantments and auras, and these will help you, uh, there are cards that take advantage of these auras. For example, there's a creature that says whenever you play an enchantment, you get to uh, give a creature minus two, minus two to the end of the turn. So you can remove one of your opponent's small creatures every time you play an enchantment. Uh, I gave one of these boxes to a friend of mine, and he got a bunch of those in his deck and was able to make a black-white enchantments deck, which was great for him. So getting into Constructed specifically. Constructed, like I said earlier, is when you take your collection of cards, for example, your Deck Builder's Toolkit, or just a collection that you've built over time, and you build a deck with them, and then you go to the tournament and play with that deck. The thing that's cool about Constructed is that you have a lot of freedom. You can choose what kind of deck you want to play with. And in this situation, you need to have a deck with at least 60 cards, and you can also have a sideboard. A sideboard is really cool. When you're playing Magic at a tournament, the games are best two out of three. 
So after your first game, you can say, oh, my opponent's got this different kind of deck that I wasn't expecting. So I can pick some cards out of my sideboard, out of these 15 cards from the side, and swap them into my deck so I can deal with this new threat. And so your deck can change between game one and game two, and then you can do that sideboarding again after game two. Uh, so you want to have 15 cards in your sideboard. And the other thing you need to be aware of is what the format of the event is. Now, a format is just the ground rules. It's everyone getting together and saying, okay, these are the sets that we are allowed to play with. Now, today, the most popular constructed format is called Standard. And in Standard, you are allowed to play with the sets from the two most recent blocks. In this case, it's the Theros block plus the Core Set 2015, and then the Tarkir block and Magic Origins, which is the, the set that's out right now. These are the eight sets that you're allowed to play with in Standard. But in a few weeks, you may have seen uh, a new set coming out called Battle for Zendikar. When Battle for Zendikar comes out, and by the way, I'm so excited about this set, you guys. <laughs> I learned how to play in the first Zendikar set, and so it's the one that I love. I, like, I really, really love Zendikar, and the new set is just... Oh. My gosh, you guys. All right, so when the new set comes out, Standard is going to rotate. And at that point on October 2nd, if you go to a Standard tournament, you can only play with these five sets, the Tarkir block plus Magic Origins and Battle for Zendikar. And this changes with every set. So it's really important if you want to play in a Standard tournament, you want to go to the website and find out what is legal and Standard right now because every three months or so, this changes. Now... I played with pre-constructed decks for a while, and I was ready to build a deck of my own. Now, I don't know about you, but I really love big dragons. Really, really expensive big dragons, because they can totally annihilate my opponent. And so, my first deck looked something like this. Almost everything I had cost five or six or more mana, because the creatures were awesome! The problem was, is that I was losing again and again because I didn't have any plays during the first few turns. All of my spells were super expensive. So while bombs like these are really fun to play, you need to have something to do in the early game. So as I played, I started coming up with decks that had a better plan and a better strategy. And so this is what I would suggest. This is that same mana curve we saw earlier. A lot of cards that cost two and three mana, and then you want to have cards that follow a specific strategy. In this case, I went for red and blue artifacts matter. In Magic Origins, there's a lot of cards that make little 1-1 one -one flying thopter creature tokens, and then other spells that can help deal with opponent's threats. And so I have some great removal spells that can deal damage or change my opponent's creatures during combat, and then I found sp uh, creatures and other spells that worked on this artifact theme, making more and more artifacts so I could swarm my opponent. And as long as I picked cards that followed this theme, I was able to have a successful deck. So um, be on the lookout for these themes and sets. In fact, if you look at a specific set, you may find a lot of cards that fall into a specific theme. Uh, Magic Origins has got 10 really strong ones. Keep an eye out for them. Now, after you've played some Constructed, you may say to yourself, not only was building a deck fun to build a Constructed deck, but maybe I want to build a deck as part of the tournament itself. And that is what Limited is. So Limited is, first you come to an event, and then you're given some boosters. And then you make the best deck you can out of those boosters. Uh, that can feel a little overwhelming, which, I, which is why I suggest playing limited after a little while. But one of the great things about limited is that every time you come, you make a different deck and you play against different decks and it's always fresh and new. The rules here is that instead of having 60 cards, you only need 40 cards. And you want to keep that down to the minimum as close as possible because you always want to draw your best cards. Uh, your sideboard is just all the leftover cards that you didn't make it into your deck. So your sideboard can be humongous. And the format, you don't have to worry about the format because it's just the boosters that you got at the tournament. Um, and if you're worried about lands, don't worry. The tournament, or tournament organizer will just have a big box full of basic lands, and you can just get however many you need. Now, one thing that a lot of people ask me is, well, how many lands should I put in my deck? It depends. If you're playing Constructed, you want, uh, you want well, Constructed or Limited, you want about 40% of your deck to be lands. But that means, in Constructed, that's about 24 lands, and in Limited, it's about 17, because there's less cards in your deck. You still want about 40% creature spells and about 20% other spells, but those numbers change based on whether you're playing constructed or limited. Also, the one thing I didn't mention is that there may be some cards that you absolutely love. For example, uh, my son loves the, the card um, oh, I Whisperwood Elemental. I don't know if you've seen that one before. It's a big creature, and every turn you get another free creature off the top of your deck. It's really fantastic, and he just wants to have 
24 Whisperwood Elementals, because that's his favorite card. And the rule is you can only have four of a given card in the deck unless you're playing limited. If you're limited, if you open a card, you're allowed to play it. So if you're, uh, if you're drafting, for example, and you keep getting an awesome card, just take all of them. They're great. Uh, so that is the difference in Constructed and Limited. Now, what I want to do now is I want to uh, pass this over to Mike Turian, who is one of the best limited players there ever was. Mike? No pressure. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I, I'm Mike Turian. Uh, I, as Danner introduced, I, I made the Magic Hall of Fame uh, in 2008, so that was uh, really excited. And I'm here to talk about one of my favorite formats of all time, uh, limited. I love to play limited. It is my bread and butter. If you let me, I would play limited magic exclusively. Uh, there's two types of limited magic that I love to play. Um, sealed deck, that's pretty, uh, that's what you'll play at a pre-release typically. You get six boosters, you open them up, those cards are yours. And you take them and, and you build the back best deck possible out of them. Draft, draft's a little more involved. Uh, it's, it's, even more fun than sealed deck by far my favorite is draft and the way the draft works is you open up a pack you look at the cards you pick one that you want take it and pass the next uh the remainder cards to your neighbor and so everyone's doing this and so oh you look at 15 cards you pick one oh now you get 14 cards 13 cards 12 you do that three times and with those 42 or 45 cards that you end up with that's when you build your deck so uh I, if you haven't tried it you know go ahead and uh, go maybe to your friday night magic or find some friends who like to draft or play sealed Totally recommend it. Uh, also, uh, every set we have a pre-release, tons of fun. Uh, bring your friends and, and try out the new cards. Uh, really exciting. So three tips for limited deck building. If, if you have only one takeaway from the limited uh, portion of how to, how to make a limited deck, these are the three things that I would uh, uh, really recommend taking away. First, build a deck that you're comfortable with. I mean, like uh, I've played hundreds and hundreds of matches of limited and i basically never play blue right there's five colors in magic and i just really just stay away from one of them and, and the reason for that is i've just found i'm not comfortable playing blue i the counter spells and and playing control that's not for me and that's perfectly fine i love attacking i love attacking for two i love attacking for four i love attacking for ten any amount of creatures i can find i love attacking and so when i when i get those uh when i get my draft and i'm looking at my first pick i want to find a creature that attacks when i open up my sealed deck i'm looking for the cheap red cards i'm looking for the cheap white cards and i'm looking for a few big green monsters and that is what you know my bread and butter is that's that's home base for me as a magic player and one you, you'll have more fun which i believe uh is go, leads right to number two build a deck that you'll enjoy playing right it's like you, you're gonna have more fun when you're playing the cards you enjoy and when you're playing magic sometimes you end up in a tough spot right and you're you know maybe you're you're a little down on the cards that you've drawn that game or maybe your opponents have just been coming out and throwing some amazing cards at you and when you're having fun you actually can rally and say okay how am i going to turn this around and this is true in magic it's true in life right it's just if you have the if you have the right mindset you you can overcome uh and sometimes it's also true that you don't and they well in life they don't kill you but in magic they kill you <laughs> and, and they, they, then you just go and play play another game right no, no problem no problem or the next round whatever what, what, whatever it happens to be uh, and, and that leads me to play your awesome cards. You know, uh, one of the things I'm going to get into is uh, playing your bombs, right? The the rares and mythic rares. It, when you're looking at your cards, you know, if you are taking your rare or mythic rare, your planeswalker that that you've opened and putting it into your sideboard and not putting it into your main deck, like think twice about that. You know, it's uh, so many times people have come up to me and asked me for advice, and when I go into the cards that they're not playing, they just have the most amazing cards, and they come up with lots of good reasons about how come they're there, right? But at the end of the day, they probably, you know, think twice before leaving your awesome cards, because if it's not in your deck, you're not going to draw it. So that's, that is that. 
Okay, so uh, onto the 101 part of it. Really, there's there's six steps. This is actually uh, this, these six steps come right from the deck builders toolkit. Uh, I'm going to hit on the first four because number five and six play lands. They've already covered that, and number six is play and refine your deck. Of course, those. Uh, but I'm, I want to really hit on the the first four. So first, sort your cards. Just take them, pile. Them. I always pr pretty much just put them by color. Uh, while I'm looking through my cards. I'm reading them as I go and, you know, sort of in my mind saying, oh, look, oh, good, red cards, white cards, green cards, oh, blue cards, special pile for blue cards. They get, uh, you're right, so so uh, sort your cards however you feel comfortable with. Um, and then find your key cards, right? Uh, you, you're going to want to find bombs and you're going to want to find removal. Those really are your key cards that you're looking for, right? So you, you want to be finding, uh, you know, giant seven mana creatures that have um, amazing abilities, right? Seven Seven sevens, right? Uh, rares and mythic rares are, are usually the best place to look for uh, these sort of bomb cards. You can definitely find some amazing commons and uncommons, but uh, you know, going to the back of your pack and saying, "Ooh, what what is there?" That's definitely the place to look for bombs uh, first. Uh, removal, right? Cards that kill your opponent's creatures, kill your opponent's threats. Uh, Ravaging blaze, you know, un uncommon here in Magic Origins. It, it kills a creature, it, uh, it damages your opponent, super powerful, right? It says, oh, like, what are your opponent's bombs? Well, it doesn't matter because you're just going to kill them. So number one and two uh, are definitely sorting your cards, finding your key cards. Explore your options. Okay, so you, now you, you found, your, you know, your best red and white cards. Uh, very excellent work. Uh, and so it's like, okay, like, what, what, what other cards are there? What are the commons and uncommons that really make your deck work? Um, evasion cards are always really powerful, right? Cards that say, oh, I can't be blocked, right? Uh, here we have a card with Menace, which says it's harder to block, right? Uh, flying creatures are always excellent for this. Uh, you know, just finding cards that say, hey, they're going to, you know, they're going to keep you alive and keep you going while you're looking for your bombs and hopefully push through some damage. Um, inefficiency. Here's just a really uh, a really good creature, right? It's a, it's four mana. It, it'll be at least probably a four four when it comes into play, uh, and it just grows bigger from there. So you know, look for cards. Typically, cards that are more inexpensive have good power to toughness ratios, and uh, you know, efficiency is often uh, other removal or more situational removal also. So uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a couple decks here. So these decks are from the winners of uh, Grand Prix Detroit. Um, there's, it was a three-person event, and so we're going to look at a, a red-green deck first. Uh, this is uh, Jacob Wilson's deck that he played. Uh, and you can see here he has uh, a pretty nice mana curve, right? He has a lot of – his deck's aggressive, so um, a lot of two, three, and four mana creatures actually spread pretty evenly among them. And then a few cards at the top, right? And you see here, like, he has that removal uh, spell, Ravaging Blaze, uh, which is really excellent for him. And then a lot of just solid creatures, right? The red-green aggressive strategy, he just wants to keep deploying creatures to the board, um, attacking with them, and then uh, uh, finishing them off with, uh, with bombs at the end of the game. Next up, we have a more controlling deck. Uh, this is Sam Pardee, uh, Jacob's teammate. These guys were all teammates that, uh, that won the event. He's playing white-blue. Uh, and you can see here his deck's a little more controlling. And if you look at that mana curve that Dave was alluding to more, you can tell his deck's more controlling because instead of having the, the as many two drops, uh, he has a lot more in the three mana spell. A lot of claustrophobias, right, which uh, help lock down your opponent's creatures, right? So just a really strong deck. His bomb here, Thopter, uh, Thopter Spy Network, uh, you know, just it'll keep pumping out those 1-1 one, one flyers, right? One of the... the so important in Magic is a getting some card advantage, especially when you're playing a control deck. So uh, the fact that you can start making a 1-1 Thopter every turn uh, really will make a difference in the late game. And also it draws cards. So it's, it's card advantage uh, more ways than one. Last, we have my favorite deck, which is uh, Matt Nass. And here you can see he has tons of one-mana spells, right? I think he has one, two, five one drops he has it looks like seven or eight two drops so almost over half of his spells are one and two mana right and if you think about that versus the the control deck like not that he would play his teammate but uh who had so many three mana spells it's like uh He's just going to end up deploying so many one mana cards and two mana cards to the board that Matt's just going to be far ahead by the time his, his opponent even even gets into the game. 
So, uh, you know, the next real great opportunity, I mean, of course, you're here at PAX. There's tons of magic to go play. But uh, Battle for Zendikar is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, on Magic Online a, a week or so after that. And, you know, go check out Battle for Zendikar. Like Dave said, tons of fun. And uh, I really recommend it. And, of course, if you do have a, a deck that you want to show afterwards and get some advice on, we'll, we'll be here. So uh, check it out. With that, I break... Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Yay. With that, I, I, I hand it over to Sam. All right. So I'm uh, Sam Stoddard. I'm a game designer, and I work on final design and development. So I kind of work on both creating the, the cards and balancing the cards. And what I'm going to talk about is what, what, what's the best? You know, a lot of times when you're building a deck, the trick is to build the deck full of good cards. So you look at these three cards. Which of these is the best card? All right, so you have Shock, which is uh, one mana for two damage is an instant. Volcanic Hammer, two mana for three damage is an instant, or as a sorcery. And Lightning Bolt, which is one damage for, or three damage for one mana as an instant. Well, it's pretty easy. It's Lightning Bolt. It's, you know, in this case, it's a strictly better. It is an always better than the other two cards. So if you could play 30 Lightning Bolts in a deck, you would just choose to play 30. Maybe you want, if, if you're playing a format where you can't do that, of course, you can mix and match these, but you're always going to start with four lightning bolts. The thing is that it's not always that easy. So which of these is the best? Magma Jet only does two damage, costs two mana, but it lets you scribe two when you cast it, which means that you look the top two cards of your library and you can kind of see what's coming up or adjust your draws. Volcanic Hammer again, the same one from last time. It's a sorcery, so it's not quite as versatile as Magma Jet, but it does three damage. And if you're looking to kill three damage creatures, well, that's the one to go for. Flame Slash. Back to costing one mana, also a sorcery, doesn't hit players, but it does four damage to a creature, so it's much more efficient than the other cards, but with some drawbacks. So what we try to do when we're making magic cards really is create a lot of options like this. Uh, if any of you play D&D &D or any game like that where you get a broadsword, then you get the plus one broadsword and plus two broadsword, well, when you get the plus two broadsword, you can kind of throw your plus one broadsword away. You don't need that anymore. What we want to do is make sure there are a lot of options when you're building your deck so that you know, you have different things. So one deck may want to play Flame Slash, and a totally different deck may say, you know, I just want to save all my damage only for my opponent, so I want to play Magma Jet or Volcanic Hammer. So we'll, we'll take an even more difficult way. Which of these cards is the best? OK. These are a little different. So uh, Donate's a three mana sorcery where you uh, give your opponent one of their, uh, your cards. Uh, Elf Replica is a three mana 2-2, two -two, which is pretty far below the curve. And for two mana, you can sacrifice it and destroy an enchantment. I will note that we often just charge you two mana as an instant to destroy an enchantment or artifact, so it's a little far below the curve. And Tarnished Citadel, well, uh, if you really need colored mana, it just costs you three life. All three of these cards were in Pro Tour winning decks, the highest level of competition. Uh, now, that's because formats, of course, uh, they're, they're often unique and they have holes. And sometimes, like Donate, for instance, was in a combo deck where you played an enchantment called Illusions of Grandeur where uh, it had a, a high upkeep cost, but uh, when it came into play, you gained 20 life, and when it left play, you lost 20 life. So you would gain 20 life, give it to your opponent, and either destroy it or let the upkeep tick away and they would die. Uh, Elf Replica was in a deck that was trying to return artifact from its graveyard. So the ability to sacrifice it over and over again to destroy its opponent's enchantments was just a useful thing, and it got to take advantage of the fact that it was an artifact, and you know, even though it wasn't very efficient, it was getting these back. Tarnished Citadel was in a deck that there was just no mana fixing in the entire block for the most part, at least for enemy colors, and the person playing the deck said, that's just how much I need to fix my mana, and was willing to play a Tarnished Citadel just to get that done. So when you're looking at cards, often you can think, you know, what can you do with the cards? And just because one card looks better than another doesn't mean that there might not be a, a niche option for these cards. Finally, which of these is the best? All right. So I heard Siege Rhino. I heard Siege Rhino. Uh, if you play Standard, you probably know a little bit of thing, of a thing or two about Siege Rhino. It's, uh, it is a very well-known card. It is very powerful. But what if you played Commander? Siege Rhino is good in Commander, but Burgeoning, well, this is a card that scales with each player. So in Commander, which is a format where there are like five or six players, well, all of a sudden, you know, you played on turn one, and by the time it comes back to you, you could have four lands in play. 
That's a very strong effect. If you have ways to draw cards, well, you know, th this card, it's not great in 1v1 matches because at the best you're playing two lands turn, but in a, in a multiplayer format, that's great. And Slash Panther was for a very long time a vintage all-star. Uh, it might sound crazy. This is uh, it, essentially, it's a five mana 4-2 haste. But at the time this was seeing play, Jace the Mind Sculptor, which is one of the strongest cards we ever printed, was hugely popular in vintage. And people were saying, well, how are we ever going to deal with this? And it turned out the answer was, uh, because in vintage, there are cards that let you produce a ton of mana very quickly. Just this, you know, four, basically four mana artifact creature with haste was just enough to kill Jace. And so there was a, 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 a vintage championship where everyone was scrambling to find foil slash panthers for their decks because this was like the, the big new thing. So keep in mind that when you are building decks, you know, looking at what the format is, is very important. And knowing which tools uh, you need to have in the format is, is very important to finding out what should be put in your deck and, uh, and which cards are going to be the strongest. This all comes back to the metagame. So, the, you know, the, the, what's a meta you? This, a metagame is kind of a game within a game. So the idea is that we have paper, rock, scissors. So let's just say that there's a, a huge world competition for paper, rock, scissors. You know, most people like, uh, they like paper. They're just like, paper's greatest. We, you know, articles on the internet are written about how, you know, just throw paper, paper's the best, it's fine. Uh, the people who are throwing rock, they're not so happy. They're just like, paper is just too good, I don't get it. You know, why are, why are they letting, why do they let people still throw paper? It's impossible to beat it. But if you show up and you're like, mm, I got scissors, all of a sudden, everyone who's throwing paper is just, you know, everyone else is playing paper, you have scissors, you're just gonna win. You're just gonna, you're just gonna cut it up, you're just gonna cut everyone up, and you know, you're, you're gonna just beat everybody because everyone else has decided that they should be throwing paper. And metagames are a lot like this. Uh, what we try to do when we're making cards is have a wide variety of things that are going on, and usually there are one strategy that's the strongest or another strategy that's the strongest, but often there are just uh, opportunities where if everyone is playing one very linear strategy, if you come in with something that disrupts that strategy, you can really just clean up. And so when you think about building decks, look at what the people around you are building. If they're all building control decks, well, like, uh, Mike mentioned earlier, well, we play a deck with a lot of very small creatures and a lot of burn, maybe that control deck just doesn't have time to, to establish itself. Or if they're all playing very aggressive decks, you can figure out a way to have creatures that are just slightly larger than those or have some life gain, and all of a sudden you'll be beating those decks pretty easily. So. All right. Thanks, Sam. All right. So thank you, Sam. That was very informative. Uh, and now we're just going to open it up for questions for you guys. We have a mic set up over here, so if you wanted to ask any questions about deck building or, I mean, we have some of the greatest minds in magic up here on stage. If you had any questions to ask them, go ahead and make your way to the microphone, and we'll address those questions now. So I have a question on uh, when you're, if you're doing a draft, how do you manage your mana curve as you're taking, like, one, one card at a time? Great. Okay. So the question is, if you're if you're doing a draft or if you're and you're choosing one card at a time, how do you keep track of your mana curve, or what what kind of mana curve are you looking for? Uh, so I, for me, I always uh, I always go after cheap cards, you know, pretty much nonstop, right? Like if you're managing my mana curve, basically involves taking two mana spells over and over and over again, uh, <laughs> and then sometimes there's not a two mana spell. Oh, if there's a one mana spell, that's good. That, that's excellent. Of course, you always want to make sure that uh, the cards you're taking, even though they're cheap, they, you want to make sure they're powerful, right? So, like, one mana, two power creatures, I love that. Two mana, two power creatures, I love that. Uh, three mana, two power creatures, uh, it better have a good ability, but if it's a three power or four power at that point, uh, I love that. Uh, and, and so, for me, it's really just about taking two mana and three mana cards uh, most often. It, and... A big reason for that is that way when either later in the pack, you know, you'll end up with the four and five mana spells. And when you open up a bomb, typically, you know, rares and mythic rares cost uh, more. You, you'll know that, you know, you can take it. Like if you're always taking four and five mana cards, when you open up that rare that's four or five mana, all of a sudden you look at your deck at the end and you have like 10 cards that cost four plus mana. And that's just too much. So, I mean, for me, two and three mana are... Uh, that, that's how I manage it. I just keep taking them over and over again. And I don't have to worry about it at the end. I'm like, wow, I have 12 two drops, right? And that, that, that makes me really happy. 
<laughs> to give an answer that's slightly more nuanced than Mike's, um, <laughs> I, I would say that when you're looking at your draft deck, uh, keep in mind that how many packs you have ahead of you and have an idea about of how many cards of each uh, mana cost you're going to end up playing in your deck. I mean, you're probably going to, you know, unless you're, there are a lot of one mana two ones, which you don't see a ton of, uh, you're probably going to play like three or four one drops and maybe something in the range of like, six two drops, you know, six to eight three drops, et cetera, but how many five drops are you really gonna play? So if it's early in the first pack and you have the option of taking a, a, like a two drop or a five drop that are of similar power levels, well, you probably wanna focus on the two drop because the odds of you needing that two drop to fill out your curve are just much higher than that five drop. And as, as Mike mentioned, of course, uh, the, you know, the big dragons, the bombs, the giant flyers, the, you know, things that kill multiple creatures are more likely to be four, five, six mana cards. And so if you're early draft, you're like, okay, after pack one, you're like, all right, I got all my five drops. I am ready on five drops. Let me just see what else, uh, you know. All you need to do is get some two drops now and you open up a Shivan Dragon. Well, you're not gonna pass the Shivan Dragon. You're gonna take that because it's super powerful. And then you get to the end of the draft and you're going, you know, uh, maybe I should have, you know, maybe I should have something to do before turn four. So, uh, you know, focusing on knowing what the kind of distribution of what the cards in the packs usually look like and what you're, what you're kind of hoping to get out of it. Uh, just trying to focus on that, that earlier, the, the lower half when you can and knowing that you're probably going to get more expensive cards later on is, is good. One other thing to remember is that when you start drafting, you may not realize that there's a lot of memory involved. Uh, and so early drafting, you may want to just do it with friends. And if you're not playing at a real tournament, you, they may allow you to go and look at your cards before you keep picking, or maybe between a pack, take a look at your cards, just so that way you can keep a, an eye on things. But when you go to a tournament, they're probably not going to let you do that. So start training your memory now. No, I think that those, those are all good hints. And again, Dave, you spoke earlier about having a plan. So if you know what kind of archetype you're trying to draft, I think choosing cards that are going to fit that archetype. If you know you're a slower uh, deck that's trying to be more controlly, have a win condition. If you are, like Mike, trying to draft a more aggressive deck, then yeah, those two drops are really really the sweet spot for you. So, thanks guys. When's typically the latest that you would shift into color? So when you're drafting, you open up pack three and all of a sudden you crack a Nissa, but you're not in green. Like, would you just switch over? When's the latest that you would make that decision? Great. So the, the question here is if you're drafting and let's say you're one or two colors through the first two packs, the first 28 to 30 cards, and you, just, and you open something, you open a bomb in a color that you're not, um, you know, how, when is too late to, to switch colors? It really depends on how strong the bomb is. Like Nissa is a card that, yeah, you could take Nissa in pack three if you're already blue-red, but... It probably is not going to help you out. Pack Rat, if I opened up Pack Rat in Pack 3, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm playing black now. You know, so there, there's certainly a range. Uh, what I often try to do is, when I'm, I'm building my deck and drafting it, is focus on kind of a primary color and a secondary color if I can. That way, if I open up something really good and by the time I hit Pack 2, like certainly I'm almost always open before I get to Pack 2. So Pack 1, I'm like, well, I'm playing a blue-green deck, but I'm like really kind of focusing on trying to get more of one color so that if I do open up something great in Pack 2 or get past something great, I can go into that. Uh, going Shifting in Pack 3, unless I am at a point where it's something like, you know, I've got 12 blue cards and four green cards, and it's pretty easy to kind of make a, a value assessment of, is this one red card better than these four green cards? If the answer is yes, then I'll look to going into it. If it's kind of like, well, I would need to get like three more good red cards, then I'm probably gonna kind of stick with my current plan. Many times if you see a card later uh, in, in a later pack that requires a whole lot of a different mana, say a big dragon or a big demon or something like that, um, that heavy mana requirement of two or three or four of that, of that color requirement, I, I feel sad and I pass it because I, I'm not ready to go heavy into that new color. Uh, one of the things that I do to sort of uh, prepare for that is, I mean, one of the things Sam touched on is having a strong primary color. Uh, and, and so I'll, early in the draft, I'll, if I'm like, oh, I've taken a lot of white cards, I'll, I'll take another white card, maybe over a slightly stronger card in, in my potential secondary color. Uh, but another thing to, to really consider is drafting some lands and mana fixing. Uh, I really like drafting cards like Evolving Wilds, right, which just lets you sack and get uh, any basic land from your deck. Because one of the things that it does is it 
gives you that option if you, in the third pack, especially if I know that there's a good single color, a spell like a fireball or a blaze, right, that I, I, that I would splash for if I opened it, uh, taking the Evolving Wilds type card or mana fixing, uh, especially if it's uh, land-based mana fixing. I really like land-based mana fixing. If you're, if you're thinking about a deck that has 23 spells and 17 land, well, you know, in the 42 cards that you draft, um, you're only going to ever play t about 23 spells, right? And so at getting a, a few lands that would help in that type of situation really can make a big difference because it just keeps your options open a, a little bit more. Right, and certainly cards like Blaze, like you mentioned, anything that's like XR, DLX damage, you can just splash that. Like, R if you're red. Right, sorry, <laughs> red. Yeah, if you... <laughs> If you, uh, you know, there are plenty of really powerful cards that if you, you know, you can just take it and then if things work out, you know, play a few lanes of that color and hope to get lucky. Anybody else? No? All right, guys. Well, hey, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out today. Hope you guys have a fantastic PAX. And uh, our next panel will start at 4 o'clock, so that's uh, uh, suits optional, brands required, how to get a job at Wizards of the Coast. So if you wanted to, to join us, that would be... Uh, That'll be the next one up, so stay tuned. Have a great PAX, guys. Thanks, everyone.